All right, good morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, so this talk uh, is going to be a little bit of a rant, so apologies in advance. Uh, so I hope you give me the latitude to rant a little bit in this talk. It will have a couple of demos, so I hope I don't disappoint by the end of the whole thing. So uh, my name is Abhay. Um, I run a company called We45. Uh, we do application security. Uh, we do a lot of training. In fact, we finished a couple of trainings in this very conference around DevSecOps, containers, and so on. Apart from that, we also uh, have a vulnerability management product. We do uh, pen testing, threat modeling. We do a lot of work in automation. So we do stuff around threat modeling as code. One of our projects is an open source project called Threat Playbook, which is a threat modeling as code framework. You can check it out if you want on GitHub. If you want to contribute to it, we'll be more than happy to receive your contributions. Other than that, we have a lot of other automation-related projects on our GitHub page. Uh, we also have a, uh, we do also do a lot of work in the cloud-native side of the fence. So we have another open source project called Dam Vulnerable Functions as a Service. So if you are in the serverless, if you want to learn serverless security, if you are in, into serverless security testing, or if you want to understand more about serverless itself, that may be a project that you want to check out as well. So this is something. Uh, that we have, we contribute to a, uh, a lot to the open source world at large. So this is me. So um, I'm going to get right to it. So today's talk is going to be about a few things. So today, the, the premise of this talk came from the fact that a lot of us are using CI tools, right? And when I say CI tools, I mean Jenkins, right? How many of you, uh, essentially, CI is equal to Jenkins, right? For a lot of our organization CI is automatically Jenkins. Now, when I was seeing this, I see, especially for a lot, of, uh, a lot of us who are born in the cloud, or at least have a lot of workloads on the cloud, Jenkins and some of these traditional CI uh, approaches were not making a lot of sense, especially for many of our clients that we consulted with. We saw that Jenkins started to become, or many of these tools, I'm not just talking about Jenkins, I'm talking about a bunch of tools, they started to become a little bit of a, a bottleneck, so to speak, right? So this talk evolved from that need, where how could we leverage cloud-native stuff? How could we leverage stuff that you're already doing with cloud applications and cloud application delivery to make this better, right? So a little bit more cloud-native, a little bit more collaborative, a little bit, you know, uh, that was the idea of the talk. So the agenda for today's talk, we're going to start with some CI problems with security tools. Now, all of us know that security tools are not perfect, right? Uh, all of us have dealt with security tools. A lot of times we've wanted to hurl our mug of coffee at a security product on screen, then realize that we're going to make a mess of it ourselves. So uh, we've had problems with security tools, and we've had very, very serious CI problems with them. And then we've had security problems with CI tools, right? A lot of CI tools don't necessarily fit the bill. And when we are in security, CI tools kind of are squishy targets, right? I'm sure somebody who has tested Jenkins or tested some of these products in-house or even on the internet find that you could do some kind of easy exploits against this. So the idea is we're going to start with that, and then we're going to look at a new hope, which is going to be essentially how do we do slightly more unconventional CI-related uh, activities, or how do we do unconventional security feedback loops with cloud-native stuff? So we're going to look at that. We're going to have a couple of demos, and we're going to be closing the presentation with that. As always, before I get started, I pray to the demo gods. I do have a couple of live demos, and live demos are always uh, dancing with fire. So uh, I do have a couple of live demos, but I hope it go well. And anyway, I'll talk you through the demos. You'll see what the demos are all about. All right. So one of the fundamental problems with a lot of security tools is this, right? Security tools kind of have a very narcissistic approach to doing a lot of what they do. A lot of them do, at least. Right? They're like, you know what, if you're using my tool, you want to see my dashboard. I don't really care for your process. I don't care for your developer workflow. You have Jira, I don't really care. You need to see my dashboard to get whatever it is that you want to get. Right? So run my tool, see my dashboard. We've seen that a lot. Right? A lot of security tools don't really integrate or play well with developer workflows. They don't integrate with GitHub issues. They don't integrate with pull requests. They don't integrate with a lot of the stuff that our developers need security to be with, right? So a lot of our tools have that problem. And the other thing we see is inconsistent APIs, right? 
How many times have we gone in and identified a security tool and wanted to run in a CI, CD, or some kind of an automated workflow and realized, oh, you can't do that, right? Oh, this tool can only automate scans, but you can't do anything else. Uh, pulling out a report gives you an HTML report. Sorry, I'm, that's it. That's what we have. You don't really have very actionable or consistent APIs. And the other thing I'm sure a lot of you have seen is long running jobs. How many of you have had DevOps breathing down your neck saying, your security tool runs for two hours. Our DevOps pipe runs for two minutes. I hate you. And I don't want to work with you ever again. And they throw you off the pipeline, right? A lot of times you'll see that your tool that you had integrated within the pipeline is now suddenly magically turned off because, you know what, it, it was blocking the pipeline. So we had serious issues. So there are a lot of these problems. So security tools, it's really all about me. We have a, a little bit of a narcissism issue with a lot of the security tools that we're dealing with. So again, the dashboard ends up being, hey, this is my dashboard, look at me, look at me, look at me. I don't really integrate with anything else. I don't care about it. Your problem, your workflow. You are a security person, why do you care about another dashboard? Why do you care about another tool? My tool is good enough for whatever you need, right? These are some things I'm sure some of you would have seen. The other thing you would have seen is this, right? A lot of security tools claim to have API, but they just give you some basic instrumentation, basic stuff that not really uh, you know, adds value to an automation process. API, at least uh, the way you would want it, is hardly available with a lot of security tools. You need to have fully featured, fully functional API, but most of the time it's just basic stuff that you can orchestrate and work with when you're working with a lot of security tools. Of course, I, I think I just jumped past the last one. The, not, the other thing that we like to all, always do is we want to integrate with developer workflows. We, in fact, when you look at DevSecOps, one of the key things that a lot of folks tell you is get it closer to the developer. Developer-centric, developer-first, developer as the primary customer of your security processes. Because developers are the primary customers of our security processes. And that means Jira integration, GitHub integrations, and so on and so forth. But we as security teams love to hold stuff within our own teams, right? So instead of doing useful developer-first integrations, we kind of go into this, hey, we need to control this flow. We need to control what this tool gives. We need to triage. We need to figure it out, and then we'll feed it. Because developers are not going to fix anyway. We have this attitude that a lot of developers don't really listen to what we're saying, and they don't really care about what we're saying. So automatically we go into, let's go into another silo and make this another control issue about InfoSec. So that's something that we see a lot of with a lot of security tools. And then of course we have long running jobs, right? Now how many of you have had a pipeline where a developer commits code, that code, a unit tests are run, then you have SAST, then you have source composition, then it gets built and deployed into some staging environment, then you run DAST, and then you're, you're done with the pipeline. Have you ever seen this working? Isn't it the advice that all of us claim to have as an industry? Everything should run with the build pipeline. If it doesn't run with the build pipeline, you don't have DevSecOps, or you don't have security in the build pipe. How many of you have actually seen this working? It's really like this. It's as, it's as real as this cat riding this unicorn, right? Because Essentially, you see that your tools are blocking, especially if you run a long running SAS tool or a DAS tool or a source composition tool. All these tools take time, right? They take a lot of time running. Your typical DevOps pipeline is about two minutes or five minutes or, I mean, nothing more than 10 at the very most. And if you run some of these tools, they go into 30 minutes, then they go into a few hours, and then you're running them nightly, and then you're never running them at all, right? So there is this mythical pipeline that we have that people say, especially a lot of us come to conferences and we listen to thought leaders and we say, hey, this is amazing. We got to implement this immediately and this never happens simply because it's, it's very difficult to do this with a lot of the tools that we work with. That's some of the challenges that we need to live up to, right? So this is clearly a mythical pipeline. So what do we do? What do we want to do really, right? So in my opinion, DevSecOps is not so much about the pipeline as it is about feedback loops, right? We want to constantly create more and more feedback loops that would get developers to notice this, 
and take action on it as fast as possible, right? Whether it's in the pipeline or whether it's asynchronous to the pipeline or whether it is a, you know, an independent set of jobs, I shouldn't really, it shouldn't really matter so much if we are creating the right feedback loops, right? So the feedback loops is very important, right? The next thing that we want to do is we want to encourage collaboration with the developers' workflows, right? So let's say our developers are using GitHub. It, makes, it only makes sense that you integrate with GitHub so that they see the issue first as soon as they commit code or as soon as they you know, uh, create a pull request or as soon as they do whatever it is they do with your, with, in GitHub as part of their workflow. So it's very important to integrate into that workflow and that's, if you use Jira, that would be the same thing. But the idea is for us to create more feedback loops and not necessarily get stuck in this, oh, let's do everything in this build pipeline and regardless of how long it takes, let's still run the build pipeline. The idea is to try and create these asynchronous event-based uh, rules that you can use to add more uh, feedback to your developers' coding process, their deployment process, their delivery process, right? That's what we want to do. That's what we should be looking to do rather than have this uh, concrete view of the world. And of course, CI tools are not perfect either, right? CI tools are far from perfect. A lot of us run CI tools. We run Jenkins. We may run Bamboo. We may run Team City. We may run XYZ. We may run uh, CI tools within the organization. We may run them on the cloud. So, of course, this is, I think, something that most of us can reasonably agree with. I don't know how many of you have looked at exploit DB for Jenkins, but if you've seen every month without exception, there have been exploits identified and logged in exploit DB. And that's just exploit DB. If you go into CVE details, you look at probably a bunch more, which may not necessarily have exploits, but they still have vulnerabilities. And forget, this is just with Jenkins, the core product, right? We're talking about, Jen let's talk about Jenkins plugins or Bamboo plugins or Team City plugins or whatever it is. The plugins have their own set of security issues, right? In fact, I would say that managing Jenkins within the enterprise is another massive task in itself, right? It's another maintenance task in itself, right? It's pretty huge because Jenkins, I would say, is the WordPress of CI. And in, in some cases, I would say it's very ironic to find RCEs, remote code execution flaws, in a platform that does remote code execution. What does Jenkins do? It runs shell scripts, it runs a bunch of scripts, which is running remote code. And if you find an RCE in a remote code execution, there's something very ironic about that entire statement. Which means that, let's say you have a Jenkins installation in your organization, and let's say there is an authentication bypass or something like that, you essentially have remote code execution, you have remote code execution across the board. So what you have decided to do by running some of these tools is one, you're running them as a web app, sometimes exposed to the internet, right? Two, you are running them with a bunch of plugins you don't know anything about, likely. Probably, I'm sure a lot of you may not have fully audited your Jenkins plugins that you run or any other plugins that you run as part of your CI. There's a good chance that that's not happening. And it's running persistently, remember. It's running persistently on your environment. It could be running on a bunch of servers. You might even have a you know, master uh, you know, secondary component kind of a deployment where you're running a bunch of these components and you're running them persistently. And again, you're running them either within the organization, outside the organization. My question to you is, why? Why are you doing this? Because sim simply because by running an event-based workflow through persistent tooling, you're essentially exposing your attack surface quite a bit more, right? Because some attacker can com compromise your Jenkins installation and then compromise your build or run their own code in your environment, do a bunch of things. You're, if Jenkins is your single source of truth or any CI that you're running is a single source of truth, somebody can easily compromise this with the plethora of exploits available for them to compromise this with. So let's look at outcome jeopardy, right? When you have authentication bypass results in RCE, when you have authorization bypass results in RCE, if you have cross-site scripting, it results in RCE. If you have anything on an RCE platform, it results in remote code execution, which means somebody can do a complete takeover of that environment with your vulnerable Jenkins, vulnerable Bamboo, vulnerable Team City, vulnerable what have you, right? So, and of course, uh, a lot of these tools are 
very CI friendly perhaps, but a lot of them are not very CD friendly, right? They don't deploy as well to the cloud. They don't deploy as well to Kubernetes. They don't scale as well when you're looking at, when you're looking at deploying, let's say, a bunch of serverless functions to Amazon. It's harder to do. It's much harder to do with a lot of these tools because they are not, they're mostly CI. They're not as CD as you would expect them to be. And I don't know how many of you have tried running containers on Jenkins. How many of you have run containers on Jenkins? How easy have you found that to be? So I guess, I mean, most of us, if you run containers or any kind of a container native deployment on Jenkins on traditional CI tooling, you will find that a lot of this is very hard to do because you need to set it up, you need to have plugins, and you need to have all of this orchestration that you're doing. Again, if you're running microservices, the same kind of a problem is going to emerge from that as well. And how many of you have seen this within organizations which, where you're running these kind of CI services? You've seen that DevOps has become another silo, right? You have a DevOps department that runs Jenkins that is so manic about their Jenkins deployment, they don't allow you to touch it. Whatever tools come into that is extremely controlled. You have very, very specific gates that you, so you're essentially creating another silo and you're saying, you know what, this is DevOps's problem and DevOps is supposed to solve that very problem. So you see some of the challenges that are getting created by some of these tools that you're using. So if you're looking at productivity and collaborations, the choice of tools that you make is also very, very impactful on your productivity, on your ability to do real high quality DevOps. So that's something that I think everyone should keep in mind. So let's talk about some approaches that we've been using, we've been seeing, in fact, for a lot of companies that are born in the cloud, right? A lot of us today are born in the cloud. We do a lot of cloud-based workflows. In fact, majority of our, a uh, lot of our uh, workloads are in the cloud. So let's look at some approaches to this. So let's look at what we want from CI, right? Or from DevSecOps or DevOps, so to speak, right? We are essentially running event-driven flows, right? A developer commits code, that's an event. Once that code is committed, that should trigger another event, which should trigger yet another event, which should trigger yet another event, which should trigger yet another event. We don't technically need any persistent compute for this, right? That's what serverless applications or serverless frameworks are there for, right? You are essentially free to run event-based workflows without persistently deploying stuff on whatever environment. You are running them, they're firing up, they're running whatever they need to run, and they're killing themselves, which means that the attacker now cannot compromise your build in the same way the attacker could compromise when you are running a Bamboo or a Team City or whatever it is. You're, whenever you are running some kind of a persistent compute framework for your environment, attackers are going to find it much more difficult to compromise because it is not persistent. There is no server, there is no infrastructure that the attacker is compromising, right? It's harder. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's much harder to compromise non-persistent compute. Right? And if you do this on a cloud native environment, you have the benefit of secrets management. Right? Cloud native environments give you comprehensive secrets like KMS, so parameter store, secrets manager, stuff like that, that store your secrets. Now, you have API tokens, you have passwords, you have all of these things. You want to store them in secure store. And a lot of Jenkins deployments, I'm sure you've seen, have all of this in plain text or in the script itself. And even though you do have plugins for Jenkins or Bamboo that can do this, you will see that there is a lot of secret sprawl in a lot of these environments. And of course, you can control authorization, authentication with the IAM uh, capability that you have in, on the cloud. And the cool thing with a lot of this is that all of these produce artifacts. I don't know how many of you have dealt with CI tools and artifacts, but pulling an artifact out of a standard CI tool is a pain. It's a Herculean task, right? With this, you can just dump it in S3 or dump it in any object store, and you can query it with something like Athena, or something like that. In fact, you just dump it as a JSON file, and you can even query a flat file JSON with AWS Athena or some of these services that you have. So you can even build up dashboards, things like that, with this interface that you have, right? So all of these things are potentially possible. Of course, this is becoming the new norm. In fact, GitHub with their actions and GitLab with their CI tooling already, has started to do this. In fact, 
if you see GitHub, especially the way they've done actions, you will see that it's very close to what we're talking about. They're not running any persistent compute. They're running them as uh, you know, ephemeral jobs that run this particular job and bring it down. And all of this is done in a very, very cloud native, container native kind of an environment, which a lot of us need, which a lot of us want. So we have some existing options already. Uh, GitLab has a really good CI interface. Uh, we, you, we use it internally quite a bit. GitHub Actions is something we started to use. If you're on Kubernetes, Jenkins X is something that is very interesting to look at. It's a little uh, bit of work to configure, but Jenkins X is definitely a uh, much better uh, Kubernetes uh, tooling option that you have. If you're running container native workflows, stuff like CodeFresh and even Azure and so on and so forth, they do a great job of running these kind of workloads, especially when you're running CI or any kind of DevOps based activity. So I'm going to talk about two of these. I don't have to talk, uh, time to talk about the third. Uh, we're going to look at two of these, and I'm going to show some demos around this. Right. So the first one is security workflows with test automation. Now, how many of you work with test automation within the organization? So probably uh, either you do it, or you probably work with your QA teams, but you do have a lot of test automation tools like let's say robot framework, or you have Gage, or you have some kind, let's say BDD, you have a lot of these test automation frameworks. Now, one of the cool things you can do with a lot of security tools is to run complete automation workflows with these test automation tools, which means just write a test recipe, dump it in a uh, container somewhere, run it, and you have your entire security pipeline from that container, from that particular test automation tool, right? So this can be done to trigger all kinds of events, right? All kinds of security jobs. So for instance, a lot of us, we use Zap, we use tools like Bandit and check marks and so on and so forth. With test automation, you have the ability to write code that you're always used to writing or the QA teams are already used to writing and scale your DevSecOps efforts a lot more faster, a lot more efficiently than you would with tools that require you to have a DSL or a very specific type of a syntax that you need to write it with, right? So this is something, it, and it's much closer to the developer workflow because it's QA, right? And when you are part of a team that's already doing a lot of QA, then this is a great workflow for you to have. So this is an example of a framework that we use called robot framework, right? If you look at the syntax, you will see that the syntax is very easy to understand. All you have to do is write this file, dump it in a container, and it will run an entire security workflow. So in this workflow, we're running Node.js scan, which is a SaaS tool for Node.js. Then we're running NPM audit to identify security issues with the Node third-party libraries. And then we're running a Zap dynamic application security test with an authentication and authorization parameter set and built in. Right? So that's really, really cool. All you have to do is just dump it in the container, and you're off to the races. And if you look at the syntax, you'll realize that it's very low code. You don't have to sit and write complex Selenium or complex test automation scripts. You can call these keywords and you're off to the races. Right? So this is an example of low code, low maintenance frameworks that you can run and orchestrate all your security tools just like you would orchestrate test automation. So I have a demo for you today from a framework called Gage, and I'm going to show you this demo pretty quickly because I think I'm going to run out of time. So let's look at this test that we have. So in this test, this, if you see, this looks like a Markdown file, right? It looks exactly like Markdown. And that's it. That's all you need. Believe it or not, right? So in this, what we're doing is we're running a task. So each task is a Markdown uh, bullet point, right? So run Bandit against source path. So let's say a developer makes a commit, you can pull that into a particular directory, run a static analysis tool, then the next job runs a source composition analysis tool, then the next job starts up Zap, uh, OWASP Zap, I'm sure some of you have used OWASP Zap or continue to use OWASP Zap. So Zap is, I love Zap, it's probably the most scriptable, most API friendly dashed out there, so please use it, it's amazing, and it's free. Uh, so definitely uh, consider using that so we're running uh, Spider and Active Scan, and then it's going to dump a bunch of reports, and that's it. All you need to do is dump this in a container somewhere, and it's going to run a full security pipeline for you. That's the power of a lot of these test automation frameworks. They're really, really good. 
except that we in security don't really work with them, so we don't realize the potential of a lot of these frameworks. So this is a framework called Gauge. Uh, it's free and open source, by the way, so you can just run Gauge for any automation job you want, and you're off to the races. So I'm going to run Gauge. Uh, so it's just that. So it's going to run the specification. And you see all of these jobs are being run as containers under the hood, except Zap, which is going to be run. You can see that Zap has started up. So we've done with the SAST. We're done with the DAST. No, I'm sorry, with the source composition. Now we're going to actually run the uh, DAST job as well. So you'll see that it's done the spider. It's running the scan. And that's really it, right? All you have to do is take this markdown file and spec, dump it in a container, run that container whenever you need to. Let's say you trigger it off as an asynchronous job, and you're done. That's it. It really becomes that simple to orchestrate a lot of these tools. right? So now we have a full-fledged pipeline. We've generated source static analysis scans. You can see that our static analysis results are out here. You can see our source composition analysis results are out here. So you found a bunch of vulnerable third-party libraries in our Python code, and that's really it. right? So running test automation frameworks as part of your, so test automation is already run. If you, in fact, if you speak to your QA teams or if you speak to your dev teams, you will see that they're already using something like this. May not be exactly this, but they're probably using BDD. They're probably using some test automation framework to run stuff. All you have to do is figure out how to hook in your security tools to that, either through containers or some other API, and you're after the races. It's really much more powerful than doing this with a DSL or doing this as part of a standard CI kind of a suite. So it's really, really powerful stuff. Right? So this is an example of leveraging test automation as part of your, uh, you know, or, or as part of your DevSecOps initiatives. And the cool thing about this is that you can do this by outsourcing the job to the QA team. That's awesome. We don't have to do anything. Right? Your QA team is already doing test automation. So if you tell them, hey, you know what? We already have this. Why don't you just extend this to cover our API and to integrate with our tools? And our tools obviously have some kind of a REST interface. If you can do that, then you really are off to the races in much better uh, style. And remember, the objective of DevOps is to collaborate. So if you have your QA teams working with you, your power is that much more amplified as a security team. So I would say definitely leverage test automation, definitely make friends with your QA teams because they're already doing a lot of this. This, regardless of what you're running, let's say you're running IAST or RASP or DAST or SAST, this makes a big difference. So even if you're running IAST, let's say you're running some kind of an IAST tool, you still need test automation to kind of invoke all these flows. So just don't imagine, hey, I'm going to deploy an IAST and forget about it. It's not, it's not that simple. Even with IAST, you need to kind of walk these flows for it to trigger all of these things. Right, so that is our test automation workflow. And of course, we have a lot of these libraries written out for security tools in our GitHub repo. Just go on there. You will find a lot of test automation friendly scripts in our GitHub repo. So just go on there and check it out. Use what you want to use and contribute if you want. So uh, we looked at Gage just now. Gage is a really powerful tool that will help you do you know, a markdown kind of syntax and automation. So let us say you want to run this with some kind of, uh, so instead of just running that, you can even do an authenticated Zap scan or an authenticated Dask scan because you already have that test automation flow built in. And that's really, really powerful to do. The other thing that we have started using is step functions, right? How many of you have heard of step functions? Some of you have, great, that's, that's good to know. Now, step functions is essentially, uh, it's, it's a state machine implementation from Amazon. So the way it works is you can trigger event-based flows, and that would kind of have this workflow that you can trigger. So imagine that somebody uploads a video to your service. So let's say you're a video hosting service. Somebody uploads a video into your video hosting service. You can trigger a bunch of steps, which would say, first, uh, read that video from S3, then you know, run this encoding format on it, then run this audio codec on it. So each of these are functions that you can run against that. And by the end of it, you have a particular output that you can use to do whatever it is you want to do. Right? You can leverage very similar flaws with security as well. So with security as well, you can leverage very similar flaws. For instance, we love using step functions to run static analysis, 
run source composition analysis with lambda functions and lambda functions remember are very very low compute just it's going to bring it up run it bring it down it's just a function that's just going to run it and bring it down it's really really that powerful and you can you can do all kinds of workflow based rules to say that hey um, only when these kind of files have been committed to this pull request only then read that and scan that otherwise don't scan it don't waste time or don't waste compute cycles trying to do all of these things so you can actually invoke these very very granular if then else choice based flows that you can use to actually run your entire uh, automation right so you can use it with lambda uh, if you're using if you're used to more heavier jobs or long running jobs you can use fargate in fact one of our pipelines we've used zap in fargate so it actually brings up a zap container runs the entire scan and then kills the container right all of this with secrets built in so zap the password for the authentication the api tokens the github tokens all of that stuff is in a secret store and i don't have to worry about it being exposed to my test automation script or being exposed to some public git repo or something like that so you can leverage all of the good things in the web i'm um, not not web sorry cloud and you can leverage your capability with step functions that you can use with lambda fargate sagemaker and so on and so forth so um so step functions have essentially a task based approach so you start off with a task and then you can have multiple branches flowing in from that particular task and you can uh, you know run an entire workflow based on that task and the cool thing with step functions is you can also run a lot of parallel tasks haven't we always wanted to do this especially when we're running it tra traditional ci tools i i don't want to run dast separately i don't want to run dast in sequence i may want to run it parallelly because it's a long running job but i can't because a lot of times our tools don't support that kind of invocation capability right with step functions you can just say hey run sast and sca this way but run in in parallel start off our dast job or in parallel contact the checkmarks api and start a checkmark scan against whatever x y or z right you can run all of those things in parallel so again the benefits one you can model very complex workflows so let us say you want uh, to run a static analysis but then you only want high severity flaws to get flagged to this particular team in this particular stack slack channel then that can happen and then if you don't have the rest of these workflows or let's say you you don't find the kind of threshold you want from that particular result then you have uh, you can you can just bypass it and move on again it's event driven you're not running any persistent compute remember that's one of the big challenges with security and ci tools ci tools are squishy targets for a lot of attackers and especially if you're hosting them on the cloud attackers are going to leverage all of these plugin exploits and plugin vulnerabilities this is event driven it's only invoked as required it's probably cheaper for you to run and it's probably much much more secure for you to run as well so do think about this from that perspective again more uh, no persistent compute no uh, and service of course it embraces the whole developer engineering first workflow because remember your developers are already on these platforms so them uh they can help you extend their capabilities by even helping you write some of this stuff as well so for instance one of our uh, examples today and i'm going to show this to you as a live demo is uh, a github pr webhook right so what we're going to do is we're going to commit some code to our uh, branch in a git repo and then we're going to create a pull request now instead of doing a standard sast kind of workflow where i'm scanning the entire code base i just want to scan the contents of that branch that has been made into a pull request so what i do first is i check whether it's a python uh, it's a it's a python example so first i check hey are there any changes to any python files let's say there are only javascript file changes i don't want to scan it for static analysis right i just want to scan python files for static analysis then Uh, i would scan those and then move on to the next step which would be hey is there a change in the requirements.txt file now requirements.txt file for those of you who don't know is the uh, you know the inventory of all of the third party libraries for that python project so are there any changes to that if there is a change only then make sure that you run a third party library scanner otherwise don't bother right so i can actually have these very very specific workflows being triggered and then i can write it back to the pr that's what i'm going to do so it's going to write it back to the github pull request 
as a bunch of findings that the developers immediately see and they can take actions against, right? That's what we want. We want it to be developer first. We want it to be developer centric, right? So that's what we're gonna do in this uh, demo, right? So in this demo, uh, I have set up a step function here that looks like this. Uh, so this is our step function. Let me just try and zoom in. So this is, uh, so what happens is we trigger a GitHub. Uh, so as soon as somebody makes a pull request in GitHub, so it hits our step function uh, webhook. Then it checks for whether there are any changes to any Python files. So it would check, hey, in this particular pull request, in this particular commit, have any Python files changed, right? So if there are any Python files that have changed, only then it would run a static analysis uh, with Bandit, right? Once it is done, it will check, has any requirements file changed? Has the requirements.txt file changed? If it is, then it's going to run source composition analysis. Once it's all done, it's going to write this to a, to back to the PR. It's going to write this back to the pull request. That's how it's working. And the cool thing about this is that with this script, I can leverage all of the benefits of the cloud, right? So let me just try and pull up some of the code. Oh, I think I may not have it here, but let me just try and pull it up from our uh, repository. Yeah, so here, for instance, we have, we have not stored any secrets in the code itself. So the secret is actually coming from the Amazon SSM, right? So we're not storing a secret in the code, which is a lot of times we have test automation script that store all of these API tokens, GitHub, tokens, passwords, and stuff like that in the code. In this case, we're not doing any of that because we are storing them in a central repository that we're fetching from at runtime when we need to run this job. Nothing more, nothing less. It's very, very easy to work with, right? So uh, with this, we're going to run this, and I'm going to commit my, I'm going to create a pull request. So new pull request from test. So you'll see that there is some change to two files. So there is a change to this Python file, which should trigger the static analysis. And then there is a change to the requirements.txt that should trigger the source composition scan, right? So it triggers both of these things. So I create this pull request. And live demo, I hopefully, hopefully it should not just bomb. Uh, and hopefully we should see some immediate feedback in the form of a yeah, you see, static analysis report written back to the PR immediately. Same thing with the source composition analysis report written back to the PR. Now, the developer seeing this automatically has live feedback, right? Or near live feedback for what they should be doing and what they should be fixing and looking at. And even from a, you know, hey, is this a false positive and stuff perspective, this is much better to work with rather than them having to go to Jenkins and then figure it out and then say, no, this job failed and I hate you and uh, this kind of stuff. So th these are some of the issues you can avoid with uh, feedback loops that are generated like this. So if you look at our step function, the execution of the step function, uh, let me see if I can pull up, yeah, this is an execution that we have. So you'll see that all of these are green because all of these steps have been invoked, right? So there was a change to a Python file, it was invoked. There was a change to a requirements file that was invoked. As a result, we had this entire thing and it has a bunch of inputs. And the cool thing about this is you have a detailed log and a log that you can actually understand, right? So you have a detailed log about every step of the execution process, every input, every output, what passed, what failed, why it failed, all of that stuff. Right? And you have logs. You, so if you are, it's obviously integrated with CloudWatch, so it comes with the logs by default, so you don't really have to think about, okay, what do I do? How do I archive the logs? How do I manage the logs? Do I delete it after every job? We've asked these questions with Jenkins a lot, or with a lot of these tools a lot. So this is an approach that you can use as an alternative for doing stuff like this. So uh, this is not all, in fact, we've done a lot of orchestration with Zap, we have done orchestrations with check marks, we've done, so this for instance is a parallel job that we've run. In fact, we, when we do pen tests, what we do is something called a security regression, where for a lot of these business logic flaws that you can't automate, 
you create an automation script and write it back into the CI process. So it would become like a regression script that they can keep running and checking against their environment. So you can see that Zap runs as a Fargate <laughs> task and it keeps polling the uh, function and then it writes it to Slack or it writes it to our Orchestron vulnerability management tool and so on and so forth. So data consumption possibilities, of course, uh, we use Orchestron in-house because we built it, but you can also use any other vulnerability management or vulnerability correlation tool, or if you have some kind of a management interface, you can use it. Now, even if you don't have a vulnerability management tool and you still have only the cloud native features, you can use stuff like AWS Athena. Athena is a query interface that you can run SQL queries against flat files, and if you've kind of uh, defined your vulnerability data set, you can actually run some very powerful queries against that. And of course, you can push to Slack, push to Jira, push to, again, very developer-centric workflows that would make a lot of sense to your developers moving forward. So conclusions, uh, think beyond traditional CI. The idea is to leverage feedback loops and not just bind yourself to this, oh, I need to run a CI tool to be DevSecOps or to do DevSecOps. That's not true. The idea is to leverage feedback. The idea is to make sure that it's as developer first and developer centric as you can make it. So that is my uh, parting thoughts. Of course, the reason for this, of course, is because it supports these event-based flaws, it supports secrets, it supports IAM, making it a lot more efficient and cheaper in many cases to run as well, right? So with that, I come to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much, appreciate it. Yeah, I have some uh, time for a couple of questions if we have them. Any questions from the audience? So the one you showed, is it open source? The PR one? Yes. Yeah. It's on our GitHub. Yeah. GitHub.com slash V45. Uh -huh. You can also follow us on Twitter because we keep posting a lot of live code sessions that we do of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in that, follow us and we keep putting out new content all the time. So I have a follow-up question on that. Uh -huh. So when you said you run uh, static analysis on Python files, mm -hmm. so do you like clone the repository entirely or like you just... Just clone it? that branch uh, okay. that has been affected by that pull request or and that is in that pull request. And since you use step functions, like how do you like persist the data that you're... S3, uh, S3. S3 or any other object store or stored in the database, or whatever okay. works. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yes. I'm sorry? Uh, so I was curious on the, the DAS scanning that you're doing on open PRs and just understanding how long that can actually take. Um, are you doing like incremental scanning? Uh, DAS is a different, uh, usually it is done as a ad hoc or a slightly asynchronous process because when you're doing a PR, you're really looking at the code. It may not be in a deployed environment yet. So DAS may come separately. So. So you're just kicking it off and yeah. then you look at the results later. Okay, yeah, yeah, or you kick it off as a part of the pre-deployment event loop. Or the post-deployment event. Yeah, post, yeah. Yeah, sorry, That's, not pre-deployment. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I have one more question. Yes. So, like, the open source code for the recording. Yeah, does the open source code have, like, support for Java as well, or it's just for Python? I think we have Python and Node.js in there. Uh, okay. I don't think we have Java examples. Yeah, because it's tough to do for Java because most of the Java scanners run on uh, lib files and jars. Right. So, so you should be able to, right? The depth check. So for instance, if you want to do this on OWASP dependency check, mm -hmm. uh, what you should be doing is use a Lambda layer that would run OWASP dependency check against all the jars. You can do it. Okay. It's doable. Mm -hmm. We've done it. It's not there as an example, but we've done it. Okay. Any final questions? Uh, well, I've got two questions. So question number one is about step functions that you're using. Because my understanding is, or correct me if I'm wrong, can you tell me why is it better to run step functions compared with a build pipeline? Because the same steps, you can put them as steps in your build pipeline and it will still run on commit or on a pull request. Right. right? What is the advantage? So that's question number one. Right. Yeah, and question number two is, um, uh, what you're doing there, actually what you showed to us, is upon a pull request, mm -hmm. rather than um, breaking the build mm -hmm. and raising Jira issues for any security vulnerabilities discovered by the tools, mm -hmm. uh, you don't do that. Instead, you just comment. Yes. On the because uh, of course it's it's nicer for developers. But my question is, do the developers actually prefer this, or they just ignore the comments and say, ah, someone commented with some security stuff. I'm I'm just going to merge it anyway. 
both are valid questions. Uh, let me answer the second one first, uh, because second one relates to culture. And culture is probably the worst or the most difficult thing to get right in DevSecOps. So it depends. So let's say you have a very decentralized, so with decentralized teams, this approach works a little bit better. Or little more born in the cloud teams, this approach works better. But if you are a very on-prem, heavily on-prem, let's say you're a bank or an insurance, that kind of a, you know, organization, then there's no point doing a lot of this at least. There's still, it's still maybe better to run a more traditional kind of a pipeline. This is more for, I would say, this is better from a decentralized workflow or if you have a lot of container native or cloud native deployments, that's number one. Uh, developers, I would say, do not like builds being broken for multiple reasons. One, most of our tools are not high fidelity enough that you can break builds. A lot of them have false positives. And if you break builds on false positives, that automatically reduces the credibility of your security tooling down to uh, subarctic levels. So I would suggest not breaking builds unless you have a very mature process uh, and a very collaborative team because and you have tuned your rules. So for instance, if you're running static analysis, if you've tuned your rules where you say that, you know what, I've, we have tried to prune it to the point where it will only give us high fidelity results, that's great. But it's very hard to do that. It takes a while. And I wouldn't suggest that to starter teams or even teams that are just, you know, kind of getting their feet wet with DevSecOps. Yeah. Let's put another round of hands together for Abe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions, I can always yeah, take it offline. We can always take it.